I've never well, been in the spotlight before. Well, and, and it's a bright one. So, listen, everybody is going to want to ask questions, but I've got a couple to start off, okay? Um, I told you I read your book, um, and I loved it. I loved the bit about your wife and her business and working together and, and so forth. So, first question is, um, would you ever back a couple with Hamilton Bradshaw? What do you think about backing couples that, because you're going to spend so much time together, et cetera? Um, I have actually already backed, um, I backed a couple in Dragon's Den where um, Pat and David came in with Motormouth, which was the idea of having a, a sports car, mouse as a car, and they were a couple. And I actually thought that they presented really well. So I think, you know, clearly it's very challenging. It's not easy. I think it's much harder when you work together and you live together, etc. Yeah. But some couples just have that natural ability to divide their business life to their social life. So I think, is it something that you would naturally do? Probably not. But I think in business, you're always backing people rather yeah. than products and services. And if you have a couple that you think are compelling, would I do it? Yes, I, I would. You know, I think when I was building my business to begin with, you know, working with my wife, it was really challenging, but we made it work. You know, we found a formula um, I made the money, she spent it, and it, it, just, it just worked brilliantly. I get that, yeah. <laughs> Clearly. <No. laughs> um, that time that I came over, uh, we had that nice chat about what you're doing in Pakistan. I think you mentioned your, your daughter's working with you and some of the, the cities and the, the whole rebuild that you're doing there. I thought you might just be willing to share a little bit with the audience about how that's going. You said it was, it's just a phenomenal effort to rebuild. Um, I set up the James Conn Foundation about seven years ago and I think it was principally on the back of having been in business and being an entrepreneur for 25 years and having the opportunity uh, to build a business to create value and I suppose when you exit a business and you realize a certain amount of capital the question that I think a lot of people probably don't realize that it's not actually as easy as you think to invest tens of millions of pounds because you spend your whole life to that event of thinking one day I'm going to realise this huge amount of money and then all of a sudden the capital comes in and it's not, it, to me, it was actually quite daunting because I thought it would be quite easy but in reality I sat there frankly not having a clue on what to do with the money because at that point unlike winning the lottery or, or, or inheriting money when you've spent your whole life making that money you don't actually blow it, you don't go and do crazy things because you've realised how difficult that journey was. And literally I sat for a year contemplating, you know, do I buy a helicopter, do I buy planes, what do I do? And of course you, you go through those thoughts and you go to the boat show and you go to the air show exhibition, but when it comes to it and you've got to write the cheque, you think, do I really need a plane? And the answer was no. Um, and then I kind of decided, you know, do I want to give it to my kids or do I want to leave the money? And, and actually the conclusion was um, that I'm in a fortunate position, having been able to create that capital, that I could probably be as smart as an entrepreneur on how to deploy the capital as I was in making the money. Because actually that money could go to make an enormous difference. So on the one hand, you know, I could go and buy a yacht or whatever the case is, or in certain parts of the world, for £15, I can make a blind man see. For a pound, I can save the life of a child in Africa who has got an 80% chance of dying through, you know, mosquitoes or malaria. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at it from a business perspective and said, what could you deploy that capital to do and what effect could that capital have, I was actually quite inspired by what you could do. So set up the foundation and put quite a lot of my capital into that. And essentially, for the last seven years, kind of spent 30% of my time, interesting enough, deploying capital. So it's what I do at Hamilton Bradshaw, it's what I do at Dragon's Den, where fundamentally I deploy capital. In the foundation, I do exactly the same. But what I look at is if I'm gonna deploy X hundred thousand or a million pounds, what impact does that capital have? And, you know, we've built schools, we've built, um, orphanages and, and now we've, we've gone a little bit over the top where uh, last year when the floods happened in Pakistan and 20 million people kind of lost everything 
Um, I flew out with the UN and, and kind of spent a few days on a helicopter looking at what had happened. And when you see from the air, just imagine 20 million people, the landscape of, of landmass, the size of England, literally all underwater. I mean, it was just beyond anything I could have ever imagined. And it really doesn't matter what part of the world it is. It's not about race or religion. It's just about humanity, where you see people who are literally destitute, who have lost everything. And I was on the phone to my daughter, explaining what had happened, and she said, you know, Dad, I, I would love to come out and just experience what you're seeing. Anyway, kind of long story short, I flew her over, and we were visiting different villages, and we came across this particular village with 1,200 people. And basically, the water just washed the entire village away. They were left with virtually nothing. And when you kind of imagine, in a country like that, where family values and, and family <coughs> communities are really the things that replace society or, or welfare systems, something goes wrong, you rely on the community. But if the entire community gets wiped out, if the entire village doesn't exist, and you've now got people who've got no homes, you know, no housing, no clothing, no material, all their livelihood that they've had for generations gone, and they're now sitting in a tent, what, what is the kind of future for that particular family? And, and the answer is really simply, for the rest of their life, they will live in that tent, because there is no government support, and there is not enough aid to get around 20 million people. And my daughter said, Dad, you know, why don't we rebuild this village and I said darling you know last week you know the plumbing broke in the house and we were trying to find a plumber and it took me three months to sort that out and you know what the sink's still not working we can't fix the tap in the house and you want to rebuild a village which is housing construction drainage or water power sewage roads schools you must be off your head where do we where would you even start? Anyway, but she said, but Dad, we can't walk away knowing that these people, essentially, for the rest of their life, you know, you've set up a foundation, we have the capital. If we can build businesses, if we can create a huge business out of nothing, why could we not? I said, Hannah, in theory, it sounds great, but I'm just telling you, I couldn't do it. But if you want to have a go, your project, because it would just take up a huge amount of my time. Okay, long story short, she said, would you allow me to do it? Can I have the autonomy to rebuild the village? Wow. So at that moment in time, I said, OK, go and do it. How, so she, how old is she? She's 23. Fantastic. <laughs> Just graduated from LSE. Anyway, so she went off with this great idea. But I have to give, give her credit. She went to Save the Children, UNICEF, Oxfam, all the different NGOs on the ground, spent two weeks on the ground, met with all the different charities and said, I want to rebuild this village. You're an NGO on the ground. I'm giving you a tender. Give me a price of what it would cost to do this. Anyway, kind of long story short, some said that we're very good at construction. UNICEF said we're very good at water. Save the Children said we're very good at livelihood. Anyway, so over a six-week period, she got all of this together, all the quotes and the projects, and we couldn't decide on what village we were going to select. She came back to the UK and said, how do I, if there's 20 million people, how do we decide whether it's village A, B, or C, I have no idea. Um, anyway, I happen to know somebody who runs um, one of the charities for the Prince's Trust, back with John O'Brien, which I think you may have met. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I spoke to John and said, John, we've got this dilemma, how do we do that? And he said, look, Prince Charles runs this charity called Built in the Environment. Maybe we should speak to the Prince and maybe he could help. So Hannah said, can we go and pitch the Prince then? I said, I'm not sure it works like that, darling. But you know what? If you want to have a go, <laughs> you go ahead and pitch him. Anyway, so she said to John, you know, John, how do I get a meeting with Prince Charles? And he said, very difficult because his diaries chock a block. Anyway, so she wrote this amazing presentation with pictures and slides and the quotes and the pricing, what she was going to do. Fantastic presentation. Gave it to John. He gave it to the Prince. And to my amazement, he came back and said, I can see you at 4 o'clock on Thursday. <laughs> Unbelievable. Anyway, so um, I go along with her and... We, we literally go to Clarence's house, and there's a boardroom, Prince Charles and four of his aides, myself and Hannah and two of our aides, and we're having this full-blown presentation, and Hannah led the presentation, pitched the prince, anyway, cut long story short, he said, I think what you're doing is amazing, you have my full backing, how can I help? She said, look, we need some support. He said, I'll send you a team of people to go out to Pakistan with you, they'll help you select the village in terms of environment, people, social, culture, 
costly, that's what we do, we did the tsunami, etc. Anyway, so we got them to advise, they helped us select, they helped us pick the NGO, we then signed off the project, the foundation backed it, um, took a year, and she rebuilt 194 houses, a school, wow. did the roads, Fabulous. I think 1,200 people rehoused, and delivered the project on budget and on time. So, Father's amazing. daughter. <laughs> Whoa. Woo. Now, I was going to ask something else, but that made me think. Um, She's definitely my daughter, clearly. <laughs> well, fathers and daughters and so forth, what kind of messages did you give her to grow up to be such a fine young woman? Um, um, I think for me it was quite interesting because I had a real... Um, challenge with my parents where when I was growing up my father had his own business and as an Asian family it's kind of accepted that you the son will enter the family business so when I was 16 I had this huge kind of debate and discussion with my dad who said you know by the way as soon as you finish school um, you're going to join the family business and you're going to do this you're going to do that I said no no dad no no we're in England now what we do is we have a discussion about this and you <laughs> share your ideas and I'll give you my views he said, no, 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 no. I said, from where I come from, you will be joining the family business, and this is what you'll do, and this is how it works. Anyway, we had this big debate, and I couldn't convince him that I should kind of at least have a say in this discussion, because as far as his view was, you're going to do that. Anyway, we fell out quite badly, so I left home, and having left home at 16, I thought I might as well leave school as well, what's the point? Um, because if I go to school, I know my dad's going to kind of end up having crafted my journey. So I had a very traumatic experience in terms of the family business issue. So of course, when it came to my daughter, I was very, very sensitive never to put them into a position. So I think for me, what I've done throughout their life is giving them total confidence and belief that this is their life, this is their journey, and whatever they do must be theirs. Because for me, I've kind of done the opposite as as you always would do. So whatever she's wanted to do, no matter how crazy it is, whereas my father would always have an opinion, you can't or you shouldn't. So even when, at the most, to me, the most craziest thing she came up with was literally, you know, Dad, can we have a meeting with the Prince because I need to talk to him. Now, you would say, don't be ridiculous, it's a waste of time, it's not going to happen. But I, what I found is, if they're bright and they're intelligent and you make them believe they can do it, I've been amazed at just how many things they can do. So I think... What I've done, really, is given her the confidence and the belief to say that I believe in you, I trust you, and the most important message I think I could share with all of you is I think the key secret to what she's done is I've made her believe that it's okay to make a mistake, that making a mistake is part of the process of learning, not that by making a mistake makes you a bad person, because if you met her, you would find she's fearless because she's not afraid of getting it wrong. Now I have one more question, and then we'll, we'll allow some questions um, from the floor. Um, I'm a big fan. Is it okay to stroke my beard? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Um, you can do whatever you want on stage. Absolutely, we have no we have no rules. This is so. Um, I'm a big fan of the venture partners that you shared with me um, that day, and we were talking about. It and I said, "Gosh, I wish I'd come up with that myself." How's it going, Hamilton Bradshaw Venture Partners? Um, it's actually going incredibly well, incredibly well. Um, beyond what I said to you it might do, it, it's gone way beyond that. We've got 20 partners on board now. Mm -hmm. um, so basically the concept is that um, one of the things that I passionately believe in is that growing a business is, is a journey, and that journey, the entrepreneur has to reinvent himself throughout the process of a business. So when you take a business that's, I'm just going to make up the numbers, naught to a million requires a certain type of skill and a mindset. One to five million is a different type of responsibility. And five to 25 million, it's a completely different job. And not every entrepreneur I've met has the ability to either develop, change, or reinvent themselves to do that. And therefore, I believe in Britain today, there is 3.9 million SME businesses, the vast majority of which I don't think will ever get to the point of crystallising value or achieving their ambitions. And I meet businesses all the time who I think are stuck in that trap. 
So I came up with this idea of Hamilton Bradshaw Venture Partners, which was to identify those businesses and work with those businesses where I would use the expertise of Hamilton Bradshaw because as a private equity business, our job is to go into a business, unlock talent, unlock potential, realise value and then sell and make a huge profit. That is the model. And, you know, a lot of private equity firms are very successful at doing that. The question is, we're not going to invest in 3.9 million businesses, so how could I use that model to give other businesses the opportunity of getting that input without having to sacrifice equity? So we set up Venture Partners as a model where we go to businesses and essentially what we say is we're going to provide you with the same expertise as a private equity house would, not for an investment for a stake in your business, but for a monthly management fee and a stake in the upside that collectively we create. So we'll share in the upside, but whatever you've created today belongs to you. Anyway, so we set up the business and we have, and essentially the model was, so we find businesses. The biggest challenge that I had was I spent a year getting it wrong and lost £486,000 because I couldn't, I got everything right and I believed in the model, but I couldn't work out how do I find management talent that's going to go into these businesses to create the value because if I haven't signed up clients does that mean I've got to recruit 10 partners and keep them on the bench how do I fund those partners because I want the best people money can buy because of the job they're going to do the cost of that versus where you know I just couldn't work it out and I went through um, a number of very senior people I hired that didn't work out. I tried three or four different methods and everybody in Hamilton Bradshaw was saying, James, for God's sake, you're the one person who constantly says, you know, put your hand up when you've got it wrong. You know, we're telling you this every month at the board meeting, cut your losses, move on, let's try another one. But for some reason, I passionately believe it wasn't the idea, it was me. I just hadn't found the solution. Anyway, cut long story short, um, had that eureka moment where I found the solution where I just happened by accident to come across a guy who I thought was brilliant, senior guy, mid-50s, used to be a managing director, you know, qualified accountant, I mean, just immaculate, perfect CV of somebody I, I would put into a business. And he'd left a company and he was a non-exec for two companies and his biggest problem was he couldn't find his next assignment because he's essentially a standalone guy cold calling, knocking on doors, as an independent looking for his next assignment. And I said, if I could give you an opportunity where you could become a partner within Hamilton Bradshaw, where I could help you find your next three assignments, and rather than you just taking a monthly board fee, but I gave you a stake in the business too, what would you pay me to become a partner in Hamilton Bradshaw? Not how much would I pay you as a salary bonus and package, but what would you pay me for the privilege of being a partner? He said, I don't know. I said, well, pick a number. He said, 25 grand. I said, okay, so you'd pay me 25 grand, and for that, I'd make you a partner, I'd bring you on board, and I would be able to help you find the next opportunity. So we would find this SME, you would go in, you'd help them, we'd charge a fee that you and I would share, so you'd get a monthly fee and you'd get a percentage of the upside. He said, I'm in. So I said, OK, here's a contract sign. It said, anyway, so we then realised that that was the model, was rather than we hiring them, we would essentially get them to buy in to our vision. When did you and I meet? Oh, <coughs> March. March. So at that point, I was still toying with the idea. Yeah. We got the idea pretty much agreed in June, and we've since recruited 20 partners, which is phenomenal. So now we've got some accept, and also all the partners that come in bring their own client universe with them, clients that they know that we can help facilitate. We've hired a client director. I mean, in fact, we had an event yesterday where we had 150 people at the event. Fantastic. We're working with all the banks, so Barclays, Lloyds, HSBC are all basically allowing us to have events at their premises where they're inviting all their clients along with them presenting to the client. So actually, it's working phenomenally well. I'm it's really proud of it. It's a good model. It's a very good model.